So you'll note behind me uh, on the overhead um, something I, th I think I've alluded to a few times, but I haven't actually explicitly laid it out for you, and you might be interested. Um, many of you written essays on uh, the psychology of uh, Shakespeare's characters and analyzed some of the characters in accordance with contemporary um, designations of their character or psychological ailment and so forth. <coughs> I thought you would find it interesting to um, get a sense of where Shakespeare is coming from on this and how it fits in with the Elizabethan world picture, which I've talked about a few times. Um, and um, and it, it's pertinent to Othello as well because he always makes references to um, things like, like heat and cold and uh, so forth, but the old theory of physiology go, it goes back to the ancient world. Everyone's composed of four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, in differing degrees, and in accordance with the composition of your, your chemical uh, makeup, you will be, uh, you'll have a certain character as a consequence of that, and the treatment will be similarly physical in nature. Um, so they explain the differences that we note in personal psychology uh, with, with what we would now call chemistry. Um, and uh, in, in psychology at one point, not that long ago, this was to some degree dismissed. Um, there was a mind-body and the mind was considered to be the thing that was being looked at and the body ir ir irrelevant to it per se. In recent years, there's uh, returned a, a great deal of interest in the brain and how chemical imbalances cause psychological uh, disorders, etc. Uh, that seems to me to be coming back to more or less the Shakespearean view. Um, and they also have an explanation for different types of people. And in accordance with the four humors, you will have a certain temperament. If you have too much earth in you, you will be melancholic. You'll be the, like the ground. The, dark, the black earth. Um, and this will make you act in a certain way. If you have too much uh, uh, air in you, you will be sanguine, you'll be cheerful. The uh, humor is blood, but you'll be confident and you'll be joyful, amorous, you'll be a cheerful individual. If you have too much of the yellow body, you get too much fire in you, then you'll be choleric in your temperament. You lose your temper. Some people are more disposed to losing their temper. That's because of a chemical or an elemental imbalance. And finally, if you're phlegmatic, if you're lazy, if you're apathetic, again, it's a, you've got too much water. And in all of these things, they have a sense of a balance. Now, there's a, a, an ideal uh, for everyone. And, but people deviate from that in various ways in accordance with the different elemental uh, properties that they have in their uh, makeup. And we'll find that uh, Shakespeare regularly refers to these things and the uh, physicians of the day would treat them in accordance with this view. So if you are prone to, I mean, actually they will often let your blood. So they'll put leeches on you and so forth. You have too much blood. If you have a fever, it's because you're 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 suffering from obviously uh, too much heat, but they will they will deal with that by uh, by letting blood. It's almost always so. If you are in Shakespeare's day, that physicians do not have a good reputation. You have to realize that, and there's good reason for that. You, know, you go to the doctor, okay, but the doctor is as likely to harm you as he is to hurt, as to help you. And so they would ab abide by the Hippocratic Oath, which is that you first do no harm. It's one of the tenets of the, the old Hippocratic Oath, not the modern version, which has deleted that clause, by the way. But the ancient Hippocratic Oath, the, uh, the ancient Greek doctor, Hippocrates, that was one of the things that he enjoined all physicians to do, is to realize that uh, they could do more harm, potentially, than good. And if they uh, wanted to check that possibility, they had to make sure that they didn't overreach their capacities. And first of all, don't do any harm. Let's see what you can do. Uh, modern science has pushed us to a, an idealization of the doctor, uh, which the doctors themselves often share. And they overreach and they cause more damage than, than not. Um, and so the professions, uh, to some degree, getting a lot of reputational damage. But um, 
I don't want to get talking about that. I do want to say that Shakespeare's view of psychology is a far more holistic one than uh, it appears. And furthermore, in accordance with this, so this is just the chemical explanation. Those chemicals are also all things are made up of them. So the cosmology is connected to the chemistry. And Shakespeare's cosmology is that of Ptolemy. I'll give you a image here. And I like this one. Oh, there you go. <laughs> the earth and the water are here on the planet. The air is above it in the realm of fire around that. Those are the four elements about which all things are composed. And then the other planets around that. And now the planets have an influence on what happens on Earth. It's literally called the, the spheres influence what's happening on the planet. And they explain something called influenza from exactly that, the constellation of the planets. We could still refer to the flu. What causes the flu? We don't know, actually. No, they, I don't think modern science still knows what causes the flu. It's not like it's not a bacterial infection. It's not a virus. Or if it's a virus, what the heck, what, what sort of virus? We well, can't. I think there, there's there's something there, but they can't fight. You can't take anything to combat a virus. I think it's the medical profession throwing up its hands, saying, "Well, no, we have no idea, and you can't do anything about it." Well, influenza is roughly the same thing, but their view of this is that the planets and the constellation of the planets had an influence on everything on Earth because everything was composed of the same elements, and that it could be further because of spiritual influence. There are all sorts of possible influences and everything influenced everything else. And so there was, and we've seen this repeatedly, uh, the idea of a, a personal hierarchy. The, the reason is ruling over the, uh, ruling the will to uh, subject the passions to an order in the same way that a king is sub subjecting his subjects to a certain sort of order in the same way that God is subjecting the cosmos to a certain kind of order, and there's a parallel between all of them, and there's a right balance. That's Shakespeare's view. It's very harmonious, it's very uh, clear, and it is everywhere represented in his work. Um, so with that said, we'll go back to Othello here, but I just wanted to reiterate that because I think uh, it, it's helpful in even, a, even looking at this. Um, now, I, I'm getting through your essays right now, and I know that, and it's, and I know a lot of you are seeing the racism in the play, which is undeniable in Act One, Scene One. There's re references to, you know, the thick lips of Othello and his black skin and so forth, and they say so it's racist. Um, and I said at the outset it isn't so. So I'm reading your essays, and I don't take it as a, you know, I'm going to show you I'm right. I just want to explain what I'm saying and disagree with the critics who I think are flatly wrong by this. So making a comment about somebody's skin color is racist. Yes. In one sense it is. Is it any different though in observing that somebody has glasses and has four eyes? And I, I think the answer is no, actually. What constitutes racism post um, the slavery is a, is a, 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 a systemic uh, bias and animus against a group of people. We don't have this in this play. We have a couple of guys making uh, uh, diminishing remarks of Othello's appearance. That's it. He is the leader of the forces of Venice. He's a Christian. He's a Christian convert. They don't regard him as anything other than that. They're, they're belittling him and they're doing it to bring him down. I understand that, but it's not racism in the sense that the, um, that the African Americans would have experienced in the 18th and 19th centuries in America. It's a totally different thing. He's not a slave. He has property. He has status, etc. So it's nothing like, it has none of those features. It's just they make a comment about his appearance. I, that's undeniable. Is it mean-spirited? Yes, that's the purpose of it. It's to, it's to destroy him. It's to diminish him. It's to reduce him to 
one aspect of it, but I don't think it's racism, a la, let's read this as if it were a text about America and the, the American South. It's not that. So the critics are wrong on this when they say that. Um, and they're right on it when they say, yeah, they make derogatory remarks about his skin color. That's undeniable. I just think it's diminishing real racism when we see it as a play about racism. It's not about racism. It simply isn't. Uh, anyway, um, so I think really what it is about, and I said this at the outset, it is about a, an extraordinarily noble man <laughs> in, in an ideal sense. This is an idealized individual. Othello is a great man. And Desdemona is a fitting uh, partner for him. She is also almost a flawless woman. So these are two great figures. One happens to be of Moorish descent, but a Christian convert. The other happens to be a, an extraordinarily beautiful, but also uh, virtuous and intelligent woman. And both of them are brought down by an, an extraordinarily evil individual by the name of Iago. Um, and the reason for his hatred is almost inexplicable. It's not because of his skin color. It seems to be related to the fact that he was overlooked when it came to promotion. He thought he deserved better and therefore he's angry but his anger seems to be almost boundless. He, he, he doesn't want to only destroy Iago he, or Othello. He seems to be willing to pervert and destroy everything and manipulates everything. So he manipulates his wife, all the people around him, and he does it through language. So he is almost a figure of the devil, the diabolos, the slanderer. He is a slanderous individual. So it is a play about good and evil more than about black versus white. The terms black and white are used there, but those are just biblical um, terms used to describe good and evil. They're not about skin color. So if you look at the book of Revelation, it talks about black and white. <coughs> it's not about races. The Roman Empire, by the way, was not white Europeans. It was anybody who was a Roman citizen. It wouldn't, you, could be, you could be an African. In fact, they had African emperors. So don't get caught into the, um, when you're reading the critics, get into the anti-Eurocentric bias of the critics, because they will lead you astray. That's not, or at least they're misreading this play. And uh, most of what they touch for that matter. Um, which is not to say that uh, you, there's not, not a case to be made there, but it's, it's not Shakespeare's case. That's my point, and I'd like to see it the way Shakespeare is looking at it. So he is, at the outset, he's twisted this figure of Rodrigo, and Rodrigo loves Desdemona. And his uh, Desdemona's father, on the other hand, wants nothing to do with him. He, he's not good enough for his daughter. You know, <laughs> I, I've already heard your case, and I don't want to see you anymore. You're not worthy of my daughter. That's the end of you. Um, and he wants however, to overturn that verdict, and he's willing to be led by Iago. Well, this happens repeatedly throughout the play. Iago will manipulate characters, seeing what their desires are, and then using them and manipulating for his desires. So he is an anti-dramaturge figure. And that seems to me more what the play is about, how um, leadership can either help or harm people. And when I say leadership, there's different types of leadership. There is the political leadership, obviously. He at regularly emphasizes the importance of kings and people in positions of power. But then there's also cultural leadership of the sort that we see the playwright represents. Right? The guy behind the stage who's pulling the strings, he's getting the characters to act the way he wants to, them to act in order to create a certain outcome. In Shakespeare's case, it's to create an orderly outcome that will fit this view of the cosmos. It's a good, orderly, blessed universe. And a good leader will lead others to acknowledge that by punishing injustice, by rewarding virtue, etc., and find various ways of doing that. 
whereas there are various evil figures that are pulling in the opposite direction. That's again consistent throughout the plays. Here we have the the most strong anti-dramaturge figure, so a, 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 an extraordinarily malicious individual. Where does Othello fit in order of the line of when Shakespeare wrote it? It's 1604, I believe. Um, and that is a good question in terms of the chronology. I think it's, it's certainly a later one. Uh, what did it say in the notes? Uh, yeah, it was publication delayed to 1622, 24. Can't be of a later date than 1604. So I would say that it comes, a, it comes after Hamlet and probably the other two as well then. So it is the latest. That's why I've taken it in this order. But he is seen right from the get-go. So we've heard about Othello from these wicked, this wicked Iago. When we finally meet Othello, it's in scene two. This is really interesting as well. The main character is not introduced till scene two. Now we saw that back in, in uh, just now with Hamlet as well, right? And and so it's not unusual that there's a plot afoot and or some sort of uh, that is something that's going to affect the the main. Uh, focus of action, but now the, the hero himself emerges in uh, scene two, and it begins with a speech, but we see right at the outset he is a very noble figure and he is not prone to jealousy. Why is he not prone to jealousy? Because he is very secure in himself. He's confident. He's not fearful that somebody is going to try and undermine him. He's not, so he's not, he doesn't look around wondering if somebody's going to supplant him because he trusts in God, first of all. And secondly, he um, has no malicious thoughts himself, so he doesn't suspect them in others. So there's a naivete there in him. But he's presented as an, uh, an extraordinarily noble figure. And if anything, he um, misunderstands others' intentions because of this. He thinks they must similarly want good things, and that's what allows Iago to get under his guard. Um, maybe slightly pompous and self-important, I don't know, but uh, let, I'll read a few uh, lines here and we'll see this, but he truly loves Desdemona. That is also the case here. And wants her good. He wants her to flourish in life. Uh, there's no sort of lust he doesn't love her like there's a power difference or who knows what. Um, it's, he seems to love her and want what is good for her. And he actually, we're going to find in terms of the, uh, uh, the consummation of the marriage, he's not even that interested in it, which seems rather extraordinary. Whereas she is, which doesn't fit the picture very well either and may st stretch credulity somewhat, I don't know. But he, he genuinely is uh, wanting her good in the, in the best sense. But we'll, I'll read some of the extracts here. So Iago begins with Othello. Uh, and Iago says, Though in the trade of war I have slain men, yet do I hold it very stuff of the conscience to do no contrived murder. I lack iniquity sometime to do me service. Nine or ten times I had thought to have yerked him here under the ribs. Iago appeals to his own conscience regularly and talks about how he won't do things because of moral scruples, which is a flat lie because he has no moral scruples, we are uh, soon going to learn. And furthermore, his business seems to be to destroy others' conscience, their moral discernment. Just like the witches in Macbeth uh, will declare foul, fair is foul and foul is fair and will create a moral fog uh, Iago does the same thing, but he appeals to conscience, and in, in doing this he'd be a good Machiavellian, because a good Machiavellian politician does exactly that. He, he realizes that in order to be effective he needs to be seen to be good, and that's how Iago presents himself right here to Othello. I lack, the, he has the, the, the conscience to do no contrived murder. So he might be able to murder, but not if he thinks about it, because his reason 
overrules his passions. And Othello likes what he says and is in agreement with him being um, w unwilling to shed blood unnecessarily. And so he says, "'Tis better as it is." Nay, but he prated and spoke such scurvy and provoking terms against your honor that with the little godliness I have, I did full hard forbear him. But I pray you, sir, are you fast married? Be assured of this, that the Magnifico is much beloved and hath in his effect a voice potential as double the du as the Duke's. He will divorce you or put upon you what restraint or grievance the law with all his might to enforce it on will give him cable. Let him do his spite. My services which I have done, the seigniory shall out-tongue his complaints. Tis yet to know, which when I know that boasting is an honor, I shall promulgate. I fetch my life and being from men of royal siege, and my demerits may speak unbonneted to as proud a fortune as this that I have reached. For I know, Iago, but that I love the gentle Desdemona, I would not my unhoused free condition put into circumscription and confine for the sea's worth. But look, what lights come yond? Now Michael Cassio comes in, and Iago, those are the raised father and his friends. You were best go in, not I. I must be found, my parts, my title, and my perfect soul shall manifest me rightly. Is it they? By Janus, I think so. Now, Janus is a two-faced god. Swears by Janus, because he's a two-faced liar himself. Um, uh, after which January is named, by the way, because it's the... Uh, faces both years, right? Faces the year past and the year present, it's looking forward and looking back. It's on the cusp of both. But uh, a ya note Iago that he is unconcerned with any uh, threat because he believes that his perfect soul will manifest him rightly. He has trust in his righteous conduct and that will guard him and protect him at all times. And this is extraordinary. It's the only a man with a clean conscience can speak and act this way. The servants of the Duke, says Othello, and my lieutenant, the goodness of the night upon you, friends. What is the news? Cassio, the Duke does greet you, General, and he requires your haste, post-haste appearance, even on the instant. What's the matter, do you think you? Cassius, something from Cyprus, as I may divine. It is a business of some heat. The galleys have sent a dozen sequent messengers this very night at one another's heels, and many of the consuls, raised and met, are at the Duke's already. You have been hotly called for. When, being not at your lodging to be found, the Senate hath sent about three several quests to search you out. "'Tis well I am found by you. "'I will but spend a word here in the house "'and go with you.' "'And then he goes. "'Cassio to Iago. "'Ancient, what makes he here? "'Faith, he tonight hath boarded a land cataract. "'If it prove lawful prize, he's made forever. "'I do not understand. "'He's married. <laughs> "'To who? "'Enter Othello. Mary to, and then he enters, so he has to break off. Come, Captain, will you go? Have with you. Here comes another troop to ask you, etc. And no. officers come in. Um, the um, Iago shows his royal nature here by his ability to rule himself. So this is the model that Shakespeare would hold up to his audience. A ruler who cannot rule over him, his own passions and over his own person and not trust God, will not trust anybody, and will not be able to rule anybody. And Othello has all of these capacities. He is a, he's in governance of his own nature. He's in, he trusts Im, implicitly God in all things, 
irrespective of the circumstances, and as a result, he is able to be a ruler of men. And he has no fear. So I, I say that because uh, I don't think that we have an instance in any of Shakespeare's plays where we have such a magnificent figure as Othello. Now, um, uh, Brabantio, on the other hand, is, is a sort of an interesting character. The fact that he uh, has come from Moorish land seems to prevent Brabantio from being his friend. Um, and um, but but furthermore, he he seems totally opposed to the alliance between Othello and his daughter on that basis. Um, so I'll, I'll come to Brabantio's speech here, and he really is uh, outraged. So Rodrigo introduces him, Signor, it's the Moor, and Brabantio says, "Down with him, thief!" And of course, at that point, the swords come out on both sides because of the challenge. Down with him! thief charges Othello with being a thief and then Othello keep your bright swords for the dew will rust them good senor you shall more command with years than with your weapons O thou foul thief where hast thou stowed my daughter damned as thou art thou hast enchanted her for I'll refer me to all things of sense if she in chains of magic were not bound, whether a maid so tender, fair and happy, so opposite to marriage, that she shunned the wealthy curled darlings of our nation would ever have to incur a general mock, run from her guardage to the sooty bosom of such a thing as thou, to fear, not to delight. Judge me the world, if tis not gross in sense that thou hast practiced on her with foul charms, abused her delicate youth with drugs or minerals that weakens motion. I'll have disputed on. Tis probable and palpable to thinking, I therefore apprehend and do, to, do attach thee for an abuser of the world, a practiser of arts inhibited and out of warrant. Lay hold upon him, if he do resist, subdue him at his peril. Uh, could hardly be a more vicious attack. He uh, opposes him because of his uh, sooty bosom, his, uh, uh, he's not from here, you're not one of us. So it's, it's, it's an irrational uh, loathing uh, on the basis of his appearance and nothing but that. So it, it, it is exactly what um, everyone, including the critics, are able to discern. And when the critics can discern, it must be uh, must be obvious because of <laughs> no subtlety. He loathes them because of his because of his appearance, and because he's from elsewhere. But what set him on to this path? It's the it's the poisonous tongue of Iago. Um, how does Iago res or Othello responds to, uh, to this abuse of language? Hold your hands, both you of my inclining, and the rest. Were it my cue to fight, I should have known it without a prompter. Whither will you that I go to answer this your charge? To prison, till fit time of law and course of direct session call thee to answer. What if I do obey? How may the duke be therewith satisfied, whose messengers are here about my side upon some present business of the state to bring me to him? So here's the problem. You want me to go with the way to the prison. The Duke wants me to go for whatever business he's calling me to. Do you want to answer to the Duke? And then the officer says to uh, Brabantio, "'Tis true, most worthy senor, the Duke's in council, and your, your noble self, I am sure, is sent for." How? The Duke in council? In this time of the night? Bring him away. Mine's not an idle cause. The Duke himself, or any of my brothers of the state, cannot but feel this wrong as twere their own. For if such actions may have passage free, bond slaves and pagans shall our statesmen be. So he accuse, accuses Iago, or Othello rather, of being a pagan. 
and a bond slave, which is just simply, obviously it's malicious, the, the talk, but it's also flatly untrue. But so there's a, there's a conflict in the play. Now, um, in terms of Iago, uh, it seems to me that Iago needs to be understood in the way that almost all characters in Shakespeare's plays are to have a metaphysical significance. He represents evil. And when I say that, it's a, it's a Christian concept of evil. Well, firstly, it, there's a sense of human nature that has two parts. It, it, mankind is a physical nature or an animal nature, and it also has a spiritual nature. And it has, mankind has the tendency, the proclivity, in fact, to tend downwards, to be cor become more animalistic, to be more like a, uh, uh, in the throes of his passions, tends towards bestiality. I don't mean the act of bestiality, but acting like a beast, an animal. Or has the capacity for being godlike in his character uh, through the act of reason and virtue. Uh, what Iago does is that he, uh, and I says, and this is what makes him a, a diabolical figure in the literal sense, he tempts everyone to make the wrong choice. He offers them options, but he orchestrates it such that they will make the wrong choices, and in the process, he dehumanizes them. Now, this is what the anti-dramaturge figure, the, the dramaturge figure, in the midst of tragic circumstances, makes people act better than their nature would have le lent them to acting. The anti-dramaturge does the exact opposite. He dehumanizes them. And we will see that he, he does this throughout this. So back in Act One, in Act One, Scene Three, Line Three Thirty Two, here, he appeals to Rodrigo to be a man at the very time when he's acting, at, calling on him to be totally brutal. Same thing that Lady Macbeth did to Macbeth when she was calling on to, you know, man up, you know, stop hesitating, seize what's in front of you, and you know, man up, Macbeth. And he says, if I do this. I won't be a man. They're playing on this sense of, uh, that he, he understands that human nature to be truly human needs to act in a moral way. She's suggesting this is irrelevant. She's encouraging him to act like an animal, as if he were not a man. That's exactly what Iago is doing here. So, and interestingly, Iago appeals to the humanity uh, of his victims when he seeks to dehumanize them. And this is the Again, a diabolic tactic. Uh, much of the um, atrocities of the 20th century, and I would add the 21st century, are done in the name of human rights. So the, uh, just an illustration, the, the language is not exactly human rights. But Hitler in Nazi Germany enacted his um, legislation against certain populations in the name of purifying humanity, making humanity better. So it was defending human rights by, by treating people as subhuman. That sort of rationale, and it, it's, so for the, it's for the good of, of, of the, uh, the folk, his, the German race, that they need to be purified of the lesser races, whether it's uh, the Slavs or the Jews or the handicapped or whatever. Um, but that was an appeal. Now, he didn't appeal to human rights because the human rights legislation as such doesn't exist, but it is to a certain concept of humanity. And in the name of defending that humanity, he dehumanizes. That's exactly what Iago does as well. And th that's exactly what the devil does in the garden with Adam and Eve. He calls upon them to be as gods. He, 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 he wants them to act in their own interests. If you read Milton's account of it, he um, is incensed on their behalf and speaks as a humanitarian. That's what that's Milton's term, as a humanitarian, as if he were offended on their behalf that they've been forbidden to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Isn't good, is, is, is knowledge not a good thing? Well, then why has God forbidden it from you? And he, so he's incensed, acting as if he cared about them. Really, he's trying to destroy them. Same thing here. Uh, and now, 
Augustine, what lies behind this is an Augustinian view of evil, that evil is in some ways a falling away from our own being. So evil is a privation of the good. Evil in itself does not exist. It's a, an absence of something that is good. And to do an act of evil is to deprive a, ourselves of something about ourselves that's essential to ourselves. And he will see that, Augustine, in Jesus' commandment, what's the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor yourself. That will be for your good that you are called upon to love. What happens if you don't love? You will actually harm yourself in addition to harming the others around you. You will lose something of the goodness yourself. But there's that here. Now, Iago, that's exactly what he's doing. He is, he's destroying the good. He's like a parasite on it. And he does it characteristically through speech. And above all, he is going to want his, uh, the characters in this play to deny that their spiritual being exists at all. He wants them to think like animals, act according to their physical nature. So he's going to make Othello, who has, is high-minded and thinks about righteousness and about goodness and about virtue, to think about his skin color. He's going to reduce himself to that state where he thinks that everybody is only thinking about him in terms of his physical appearance. He begins the play never even considering it. So he's going to diminish the, the, our spiritual good. And he is charged, interestingly, here by Brabantio of witchcraft and magic and foul charms. At the outset of the play, um, Othello is so far above that he doesn't. He just thinks it's silly. Later on, after Iago's set his teeth into him and twisted his his uh, spirit, he starts. Um, he falls under the influence of witchcraft and magic. So it's about the fall of Othello, brought about by this wicked character, this satanic figure, Iago. Um, how about, uh, did, you, did you have a comment at the back? Or I want to move on to the character of, of uh, Desdemona as well. No, okay, it's passed. Oh, um, I, I was going to, um, when you were talking about human rights. Yeah, don't get into all that. Exactly no, of course it's not, because they don't exist. Right, so it's the it's the good of human beings being put out, and that's human rights, human progress. They're sort of linked. Uh, but the great atrocities of the 20th century are committed in the name of humanity, for the good of humanity. C.S. Lewis talks about this regularly in his fiction. Um, as for Desdemona, well, in Act 1, Scene 3, we find that Brabantio says that this isn't the first time she's annoyed him and refused to get married to approved suitors. And this is really interesting. So we have a certain view of Desdemona at the outset, before we actually meet her, of her being pure, innocent, and biddable by her father. She'll do what she's told. And the problem, he, and she must have been bewitched if she's gone against him. And then we find out from her own father that she's already refused to do what he's wanted in the past. In fact, it's characteristic of her to be pretty hard-headed. She does what she wants. She knows what she wants. So when Brabantio says that the, uh, the elopement of Othello and Desdemona is unnatural, and he invokes the laws of nature, interestingly, and the proof of that is that she's gone against his patriarchal authority, which is a sort of funny thing. <laughs> um, and when there is a, a, an, an emergency council here, well, let's come to the scene, Act 1, Scene 3, uh, so that we left Scene 2 when they are called to the council. They come to the council, and um, Brabantio uh, to the Duke says, um, uh, so we'll pick it up, line 48, 
Valiant Othello, says the Duke, we must straight employ you against the general enemy Ottoman. This is the Ottoman Turk, the Ottoman Turkish Empire, which is in the, sen in the ascent of the day. So there's a military threat. Othello, we need you right now because there's a military threat. And then to Brabant you, he says, I did not see you. Welcome, gentle signor. We lacked your counsel and your help tonight. So did I yours, says Brabantio. Good your grace, pardon me, neither my place, nor aught I heard of business, hath raised me from my bed, nor doth the general care take hold on me. For my particular grief is of a so floodgate and o'erbearing nature that it engluts and swallows other sorrows, and it is still itself. Why, what's the matter? My daughter! Oh, my daughter! And everyone's dead? I to me, she is abused, stolen from me, and corrupted by spells and medicines brought out of bought out of mountebanks for nature, so preposterously to err, being not deficient, blind, or lame of sense, sans witchcraft could not. She couldn't possibly have defied my authority if it weren't for witchcraft. That's what he says. Then we find out a few speeches later she's done this in the past without witchcraft. Anyway, and do the Duke, whoe'er he be that in this foul proceeding hath thus beguiled your daughter of herself, and you of her the bloody book of law, you shall yourself read in the bitter letter after your own sense. Yea, though our proper son stood in your action. Humbly I thank your grace. Here is the man, this Moor, whom now it seems your special mandate for the state affairs hath hither brought. And then everyone says, we are all very sorry for it. And then the Duke to Othello, what in your own part can you say to this? And then Brabantio, nothing but this is so. And Othello, most potent, grave, and reverend signors, my very noble and approved good masters, that I have taken away this old man's daughter, it is most true. True, I have married her. The very head and front of my offending hath this extent no more. Rude am I in my speech, and little blessed with the soft phrase of peace. For since these arms of mine had seven years pith, till now some nine moons wasted, they have used their dearest action in the tented field, and little of this great world can I speak more than pertains to feats of broils and battle, and therefore little shall I grace my cause in speaking for myself. Yet, by your gracious patience, I will a round, unvan a round unvarnished tale deliver of my whole course of love. What drugs, what charms, what conjuration, and what mighty magic for such proceedings I am charged with all, I won his daughter. And then Brabantio, a maiden, never bold of spirit, so still and quiet that her motion blushed at herself. And she, in spite of nature, of years of country credit, everything to fall in love with what she feared to look on. It is a judgment maimed and most imperfect that will confess perfection could so could err against all rules of nature and must be driven to find out practices of cunning hell why this should be. I therefore vouch again that with some mixtures powerful or the blood or with some dram conjured to this effect, he wrought upon her. <laughs> and then the Duke says, to vouch this is no proof without much more wider and more overt tests than those thin habits and poor likelihoods of modern seeming do prefer against him. The fact that you charge him with this is, is not proof that he's done it. And then the first senator, but Othello, speak. Did you by direct enforced courses subdue and poison this young maid's affections, or came it by request with such fair question as soul to soul affordeth? I do beseech you, send for the lady to the Sagittary, and let her speak of me before her father. If you do find me foul in her report, the trust, the office I do hold of you, not only take away, away but let your sentence even fall upon my life. Fetch Desdemona hither. And then they goes away. Uh, uh, and uh, he then gives an ex explanation of why and how he came to love uh, Desdemona. 
Uh, I'll give you a short variation of it here. Um, we are in the, uh, and the context is important here, we're in the Christian world of Venice. It is a very uh, historically relevant city. In fact, it is an, it's a key city. It's on the east coast of Italy, right opposite Turkey, as far as the Italian main is concerned. Uh, it is threatened by the heathen Turks. They're a Muslim. Um, and the conquest of, of um, Italy is imminent. Uh, Othello is a convert, as I say, a Christian convert. And on a public level, has already demonstrated him uh, capable of defending the public good in the name of Christianity, a uh, faith to which he is not only uh, publicly confessed, but also publicly defended, and without any uh, reservation or without any blame being cast upon him. In fact, he is regarded as the sa potential savior of the city even now. So his commitment to Christen Christendom is, is uh, unblemished. Uh, how about the relationship between Oth Othello and Des Desdemona? Well, Othello, Desdemona, it turns out, loves Othello because of the images that he presents of himself. So he like, she likes his, the image he presents. Well, what are these images? Um, well, he seems, to, she, she, she feels sorry for him. <laughs> um, and and uh, at least according to Othello, this is the reason why it does Demona loves him. She pities him. Here's a man of war, not very good in the, in the ways of men. She loves him for this reason. Now she, on the other hand, when she comes to speak, she says that she loves Othello for his character. In her quote, she saw his visage in his mind. Is Now this is interesting. His visage is his face. She saw that in his mind. She saw the inner side of Othello. She didn't even look. It, what, she didn't lie, love him because he was black. She didn't love him because of his appearance at all. She saw his visage in his mind. She loved him for his good character and his noble intentions. And she loves the way he tells his stories. And the stories reveal the heart of the man. That also. So she loves in, loves Othello because of his capacity to, to speak in a way that reflects his wonderful nature. And it's got nothing to do with his physical appearance at all. Absolutely nothing. Uh, there is a slight suggestion that she loves him even more because her father opposes him. Eh, a little bit of that there. That adds a little spice to the dish, but uh, but but that's not the main reason. The main reason is because of his uh, mind, which is revealed in his stories, and most of all in his character. Uh, and to some degree, she's attracted to him because of the physical obstacles, not for the sake of the physical obstacles, because but they highlight what she truly loves. It can't be his physical appearance. That does me no favors. It can't be because of his position or his experience as a warrior. That does me no good. It's not because of those things. It highlights what is truly important to her, namely his virtue. So those things almost, they, they highlight the black and white difference. For her, he's white in his character, in the sense of good. Now, the other thing that's interesting is that the two have not consummated their marriage. Now, their reactions to this, so we're, we don't know this at this point, but their reaction to the news that they have to part ways is vital to understanding their character. Uh, 257 here, um, Desdemona gives a pronouncement on the right relation between mind and body. What is that? So I'll go back to the line I quoted. I'll read back from uh, 252 uh, two, or 250. My heart's subdued, subdued, said Desdemona, even to the very quality of my lord. I saw Othello's visage in his mind, and to his honors and his valiant parts did my soul and fortunes consecrate. So that, dear lords, if I be left behind a moth of peace, and he go to the war, the rights for why I love him are bereft me, and I a heavy interim shall support 
by his dear absence. Let me go with him. Why does she want to go with him? Sex. She wants to consummate the marriage. This would be a big, a huge loss to me. Correct. She wants to consummate the marriage. Well, it is real, but it's not in the eyes of the law. It needs to be consummated. But she says that if, if, if I be left behind, the rights, what is the rights, the marital rights? They've already been married, but they haven't gone through the consummation of the marriage. And that would be a, a heavy interim in his absence. Therefore, let me go to him for that reason. It, that's the reason she gives. Now, Othello, on the other hand, let me, let's read his response. Let her have your voice. Vouch with me, brethren. I therefore beg it not to please the palate of my appetite, nor to comply with heat. nor to comply with heat, it's not desiring her physically, the young affects in me defunct and proper satisfaction, but to be free and bounteous to her mind. And heaven defend your good souls, that you think I will your serious and great business scant, that is, ignore, set to one side, for she is with me. No, when light-winged toys of feathered Cupid seal with wanton dullness my speculative and officed instruments, that my disports corrupt and taint my business, let housewives make a skillet of my home, and all in dying and base, ad base adversities make head against my estimation. So Othello says that he loves her spiritually, rationally, wholly, and the reason why he should, they should agree to her uh, request is because it will allow her um, a free and bounteous love of him. So it's the meeting of two spirits. She's talking about the body. He's talking about the, the fusing of the spirits. Don't deny her this. But it's not going to distract me from the business of war. denies that he desires her sexually at all. Doesn't seem to enter his mind. Uh, perhaps it's because he's older, but note that it undercuts Iago's claim that he's a lusty moor, an old goat, a black ram it was, I guess. That it tupped your you. One, that's not true, and two, he's not even motivated by this. Desdemona is a bit like Cordelia. Uh, she defines two duties. I'll go back a little bit. She defines two duties when she's speaking to her father. She says, my noble father, I do perceive here a divided duty. To you, I am bound for life and education. My life and education both do learn me how to respect you. You are the Lord of duty. I am hitherto your daughter, but here's my husband. And so much duty as my mother showed to you, preferring you before her father, so much I challenge that I may profess due to the Moor, my Lord. So again, what, what uh, Cordelia said to her sisters, they say that they, she lo they love their father all, and said, so, well, that's, I pity their poor husbands. <laughs> if they, she only has one duty and there's no conflict and no divi division whatsoever. So she, she reiterates, and it, it, again, it shows her a noble character, well-ordered in her understanding, and governed by what is right. Now, by the end of the play, a uh, play, the end of the scene, uh, there is a terrible mistake that Othello makes. So having uh, got to the bottom of this, she hasn't been charmed. They've listened to her testimony. It's quite clear why things have transpired than that Iago or Othello is guilty of no bad thing whatsoever, he, Othello makes a terrible mistake, and that is he trusts Desdemona to the safekeeping of Iago. And line 294 foreshadows the evil that will come. It foreshadows both Othello's death and also Iago's betrayal. So let me read those lines. And Brabantio, who having said this, having heard the um, judgment of the council, the father, 
Brabantio says to, to Othello, look to her, Moor, if thou hast eyes to see. She has deceived her father and may thee. So he, the man who was allegedly concerned for his daughter's well-being has nothing good to say about his daughter. She's a, you know, she's deceived me and, I, and soon she'll deceive you. And then Othello, my life upon her faith. Honest Iago, my Desdemona must I leave to thee. I prithee let thy wife attend on her and bring them after in the best advantage. Come Desdemona, I have but an hour of love, of worldly matter and direction to spend with thee. We must obey the time. And of course now we have poor Rodrigo was hoping at the end of all this to have Desdemona and Iago, what sayst thou, noble heart? What will I do, thinks thou? Why, go to bed and sleep. I will incontinently drown myself. If thou dost, I shall never love thee after. Why, thou silly gentleman? It is silliness to live then when to live is torment, and then have we a prescription to die when death is our physician. Oh, villainous, says Iago. Note that the speech is now uh, with no verse. I have looked upon the world for four times seven years, and since I could distinguish betwixt a benefit and an injury, I never found man that knew how to love himself. Ere I would say I would drown myself for the love of a guinea hen, I would change my humanity with a baboon. What should I do? I confess it is my shame to be so fond, but it is not in my virtue to amend it. Virtue? A fig. Tis in ourselves that we are thus or thus. So he dismisses moral considerations at all. Our bodies are our gardens, to the wit to the which our wills are gardeners, so that if we will plant nettles or sow lettuce, let set hyssop and weed up thyme, supply it with one gender of herbs or distract it with many, either to have it sterile with idleness or uh, manured with industry, why the power and corrigible authority of this lies in our wills. If the beam of our lives had not one scale of reason to poison other of sensuality, the blood and the baseness of our natures would conduct us to most preposterous conclusions. But we have reason to cool our raging motions, our carnal strings, our unbitted lusts, whereof I take this that you call love to be a sect or a scion. It cannot be. It is merely a lust of the blood and a permission of the will. Come, be a man. As I say, when he calls upon to be a man, when he's asking him to think like a beast. Come be a man, drown thyself, drown cats and blind puppies. I have professed me thy friend, and I confess me knit to thy deserving with cables of perdurable toughness. I could never better stead thee than now. Put money in thy purse. Follow the war, thou the worst. Now here's what he does. He gets him to follow money. Never mind the higher things. Yes, in life, you, he gives the advice of using your reason to govern, reason to inform your will to govern your passions. Yes. But at the end of the day, make sure that you, do, you gain wealth in the process. He just keeps on saying it. Put money in thy purse. Follow thou the wars. Defeat thy favor with an usurped beard. I, I say, put money in thy purse. It cannot be long that Desdemona should continue her love to the more. Put money in thy purse, nor he his to her. It was a violent commencement in her, and thou shalt see an answerable sequestration. Put money, but put money in thy purse. These moors are changeable in their wills. Fill thy purse with money. The food that to him now is as luscious as locust shall be to him shortly as acerb as the colon quintida. She must change for youth. When she is sated with his body, she will find the error of her choice. She must have changed, she must. Therefore, put money in thy purse. Okay, I think I got the point. Follow the rule of money. Follow the money. In the end of the day, money is his access to power and therefore to her uh, affection. 
And then, Rodrigo, wilt thou be fast to my hopes if I depend on the issue? Thou art sure of me. Go make money. I have told thee often, and I retell thee again and again, I hate the moor. My cause is hearted. Thine hath no less reason. Let us be conjunctive in our revenge against him. If thou canst cuckold him, thou dost thyself a pleasure, me a sport. There are many events in the womb of time which will be delivered. Traverse, go, provide thy money. We will have more of this tomorrow. Adieu. So Rodrigo is t completely debased, um, led to believe that um, he now has a sacred pact of sorts with uh, Iago. Uh, and his motives are conceived in here and referred to, and actually we'll, we'll go to the final soliloquy where Iago speaks now explaining his motive in all of this. Uh, I'll read the whole speech and then we'll move on. Thus do I ever make my fool my purse. For I mine own gained knowledge should profane if I could sp if I would spend expend with such a snipe for my sport and profit. I hate the moor, and it is thought abroad that twixt my sheets he has done my office. So there's a rep there's a rumor, he says, that his own wife has slept with the moor. I don't know what we make of this. I know not if it be true, but I for mere suspicion in that kind will do as if for surety. He holds me well, the better shall my purpose work on him. Cassio is a proper man. Let me see now to get his place and to plume up my will in double knavery. How? How? Let's see. After some time to abuse Othello's ear that he is too familiar with his wife. He hath a person and a smooth disposed to be suspected, framed to make women false. The moor is of a free and open nature that thinks men honest that but seem to be so and will as tenderly be led by the nose as asses are. I have it, it is engendered. Hell and night must bring this monstrous birth to the world's light. He acknowledges the good character of Othello. He's got a free and open nature. He thinks men honest if they seem so. As a consequence, he's motivated by the appearance of virtue. That's how, and how about Cassio? Cassio is a proper man. Well, what about Cassio? Cassio uh, is probably a figure, a puritanical figure. Um, in Shakespeare's day, the Puritans are a, uh, a growing religious, uh, those within the Church of England and, and, and outside of it um, are um, increasingly puritanical in their motives, and that means that they, are, they long to live godly, pure lives, and uh, Cassio is probably a man who doesn't drink, and of course Othello's going to get him drunk, and when he gets drunk, he acts out of step with his character. But for a man like Othello, who is used to governing himself, to have a man who is under his rule, who is ungoverned, is disgraceful and a poor reflection on him. But in Act Two, the setting here is very different. It's Cyprus. Uh, this is uh, this is important because Venice is actually attached to Italy, and so it has you can send forces to its aid from other cities where Cyprus is an island cut off from the main body of the rest of Christian Europe. So when it's under assault, it's very difficult to get troops over there. And furthermore, then, it's also cut off from any civilizing influence. It's like a garrison, effectively. And, um, there it, it, and because of that, it's more, it's more rough. It's more uh, like a military camp. There is le it's not used to hosting women. There are men here, and this is a this is a, a soldierly outpost. They're not, uh, and so conduct is rather different there. Yes. Um, the Cyprus was controlled by the Knights of what I think the Knightly Order of Rhodes. Correct. And each nation that had taken part in the major crusades was expected to provide to provide part of the garrison. Right. 
other than those who are there for the purposes of war. And so it is a theater of war. But as a theater of war, it is a stage of sorts. And again, it's a stage on which the ego, Yago, can work his, um, work his influence without any other influences. So there's no moderating influences. Because it's isolated, it, it, it is a world unto itself, as it were. So it, it, it is cut off. It's an outpost, yes. But um, this is a stage. Now, this, there, in Act 2, we find that there's been a storm at sea that has destroyed the Turkish fleet. Act of Providence. Uh, Shakespeare would have in mind the Armada, the Spanish Armada, similarly, during Elizabeth's own reign, was destroyed by an extraordinary freak storm, this, this huge uh, armada of ships that would have surely brought Britain under Spanish subjugation and Catholic rule was just destroyed by a, a tempest and simply something similar happens here. So it's a tempest and uh, it, has, it destroys the fleet, but this tempest foreshadows a metaphorical type of tempest that's going to dominate the rest of the play. And we saw this back in Lear. There's a storm there that has Various represent, it represents the state of Lear's mind, among other things. It represents the state of the kingdom, where nature is running wild, chaotic, ungoverned. Now, Ca Cassio, as I said, represents everything good. He's a chivalrous man. He's an, uh, uh, like a, you mentioned the knights. He is, a, he is one of that sort of character. He does things for the sake of virtue and honor. And he believes, furthermore, that beauty is linked with virtue. Beauty, goodness, truth, they are linked. And, uh, and enunciates this view in his speeches. He is a, an idealistic individual, and he lives his life according to that ideal. Whereas Iago is highly cynical, and he opposes this, and his, his uh, mission is to pervert the aspiration towards godliness that Cassio uh, would uphold. And his view of women is rather interesting, but he is a cynical f figure, Iago. What's his view of women? It's uh, line 114 uh, and so forth. Uh, Desdemona says, uh, to uh, uh, Desdemona, well, actually he's speaking of women in general, a little back and forth between uh, Iago and Desdemona, uh, speaking to uh, Emilia, his wife, Iago, and he's really being sal salty in his language, shall we put it. And he, he, he kisses his wife, and then Iago says, line 92, Sir, would she give you so much of her lips as of her tongue she oft bestows on me, you would have, you would have enough. And Desdemona, alas, she has no speech. You know, you scandalous man, You're talking about your wife, what she does with her tongue, how dare you in public and so forth. And, and then in, she has no speech. And then Iago says, in faith, too much. I find it still when I have list to sleep, marry before your ladyship, I grant. She puts her tongue a little in her heart and chides with thinking. <laughs> She's thinking too much. And the think I don't like the thoughts. And then Amelia, you have little cause to say so. Iago, come on, come on. You, as in the female sex, you are pictures out a doors. Bells in your parlors, wild cats in your kitchens, saints in your injuries, devils being offended, players in your housewifery, and housewives in your beds. And then does the matter, oh, fie upon thee, slanderer. Nay, it is true, or else I am a Turk. You rise to play and go to bed to work. It certainly is. He accuses them all of, of being prostitutes, effectively. And then Amelia, you shall not write my praise. <laughs> no, let me not. And Desdemona, what wouldst write of me if thou wouldst praise me? Oh, gentle lady, do not put me to it, for I am nothing if not critical. Come on, I say, there's one gone to the harbor. Eh, madam, I am not merry, I do, but I do beguile the thing I am 
by seeming otherwise. Come, how wouldst thou praise me? I am about it. But indeed my invention comes from my pate, as bird lime does from freeze. It plucks out brains and all. But my muse labors, and thus she is delivered. If she be fair and wise, fairness and wit, the ones for use, the other useth it. Well praised. How if she be black and witty? If she be black and thereto have a wit, she'll find a white that shall her blackness hit. Worse and worse. So lots of puns here. Um, but his view of woman is, is disgraceful. Now, uh, Iago's attempt at, at poetry here, uh, which line 49 and follow, is, is really poor. And uh, Desdemona's response all this, to all this is that uh, Iago is a slanderer and that he is uh, impotent. Uh, Desdemona is able to hold her own in the Battle of Wits, needless to say. Um, uh, let me skip on a scene uh, to scene three. This is a, a vital scene to the whole thing. Uh, uh, let me actually I'll conclude Act 2, Scene 1 with, again, uh, Iago's speech. Now, it's interesting that the main figure of soliloquies is the evil character. We don't have Hamlet give, delivering soliloquies. We have the evil character, Iago, delivering them. So they go out. Rodrigo goes out. And Iago says that Cassio loves her, I do well believe. That she loves him, tis apt and of great credit. The moor, how be it that I endure him not, is of a constant, loving, noble nature. And I dare think he'll prove to Desdemona a most dear husband. Now, I do love her too, not out of absolute lust, though peradventure I stand a, compt a competent for as great a sin, but partly led to diet my revenge, for that I do suspect the lusty moor hath leapt into my seat. The thought whereof doth, so it's just because he, he has no proof, he imagines that the moor has slept with his wife. He has no proof of it whatsoever, none. It's not in his character, it's not in his wife's character, but he imagines it because he's an envious sort of individual. It fits with his nature. Whatever the reason, he has no reasoning. When he reasons about it, he can't come up with an explanation. He just has bad, insinuates bad actions. Yes? Because he has such weird reasoning, do you think it's just because he's such a demonic character and he needs to be good? For the sake of good, there's no, yes, I do. So he's a better and fitter representative of evil that he can find no good, true reasoning. If he were a better character, he would at least excuse his evil deeds by good, with a good motivation. I mean, Milton's Satan has better explanations than Iago. Iago seems to have no good explanations. He's a very evil character and seems to represent a, almost a figure of evil rather than a person who is evil. So I would have thought a person would have a better reason, but he dismisses all reasoning. He cut, undercuts his own argument. He's partly led, led to die at my revenge for, I, for that I do suspect the lusty more that leapt into my sleep. The thought whereof doth like a poisonous mineral gnaw my inwards, and nothing can or shall content my soul till I am evened with him, wife for wife, or failing so, yet that I put the moor at least into a jealousy so strong that judgment cannot cure. Which thing to do if this poor trash of Venice, whom I trace for his quick hunting, stand the putting on, I'll have our Michael Cassio on the hip, abuse him to the moor in the rank garb, for I fear Cassio with my nightcap too, make the moor thank me, love me, and reward me for making him egregiously an ass and practicing him on, upon his peace and quiet even to madness. Tis here. But yet confused, knavery's plain face is never seen till used. Uh, what's the reasoning for his, his hatred? He imagines it. Is he going to have real vengeance? Yes, he is. Is he going to disguise it beneath the surface? Yes, he is. It's a play about what's on the surface 
and what really lies beneath it. What's on the surface will be reduced to Othello's face. How, his appearance. He'll even start talking about his own appearance. And, uh, and there'll be all sorts of playing and manipulating so that Othello is convinced that everybody is not virtuous and don't act virtuous, and they, and they never do. He will begin to doubt himself. He'll be incapable of action. He'll be caught up in his mind. He's the, he becomes like a, a, Ham, a Hamlet type figure, incapable of action. Thoroughly confused. His inner world is overturned. In, in Hamlet, Denmark is overthrown. His father is killed and he cannot act. In Othello, it's the inner world that's assaulted. His mind is under assault. It's an inner assault by, by the means of language and it makes him doubt and flip around his entire character. This is a man of action. This is Fortinbras. He's the opposite of, Othel of, of Hamlet in his character and nature. And yet he's capable of, of, of intellectual thought. And in fact, he loves the good and loves beauty for the sake of the beauty and for no other reason. But he is going to be turned inside out. And that's really what the play is about. So if it's racism, um, that's a very superficial, superficial reading of what's really going on in this play. Anyway, we'll come to it next time. I know we have our own play next time. Uh, we'll start off with that, but then we'll move on uh, to Act 2, Scene 3, and we'll look at how Iago destroys Othello and uses his jealousy, which he, of which he had none, naturally, to bring about his wife's demise and his own. Okay? Let's move then.